Hey Knights, so, um, I just recently rechecked the subscribers because it just makes me happy to see how many of you guys actually enjoy the actual videos I post, which, because I think they're kind of bad, but it's still in the early stages, I guess, so can always use for room of improvement, but last time I checked, it was... 34 and now I'm at 36 and I just want to say thank you guys so much because I don't without you guys I probably wouldn't keep posting these videos and yeah that's basically it this is me just saying quick thanks before I do another quick blurb or jeez <sighs> reading I can't talk let's see how well my reading is going to do today <laughs> um so I'm doing the Running Through the Stars, and this is chapter 11 to 12. I should write that down before I forget. 11 to 12. Okay. Because I will forget if I don't write it down. Okay. So chapter 11. The Long Game. Jessie stepped out of the TARDIS when it materialized, and she looked around curiously. Now where have we gone this time? So, the doctor began, doing a 360. It's 200,000, and it's a spaceship. He paused. No. Wait. Space station. And he pointed to a gate nearby. Go and try that gate over there. Off you go. 200,000? Jessie asked for clarification. He nodded. 200,000. Right. She opened the TARDIS door and beckoned. Adam? Out you come now. The boy did as beckoned, and his jaw dropped instantly. Oh my god. You get used to it, Jessie assured him, doing a little dance on the spot, and the doctor chuckled as he watched her. Where are we? Adam asked. Good question, Jessie replied brightly, stopping and pretending like she was assessing the situation. Judging by the architecture, I'd say we were, the, we we're around the year 200,000. She sent the doctor a look when he snorted in amusement. Shut up, she mouthed, and he hit and he held up his hands in surrender, letting her continue her assessment. If you listen, yeah, engines, she replied, smiling. We're on some sort of space station. She made a look of concentration, ignoring the, dark, the doctor's whitening smirk of amusement. Yeah, definitely a space station. It's a, a bit warm in here, too, and could do with turning the heat down. She looked over. You know what? Let's try that gate. Come on. She took off, letting the doctor and Adam follow her as she went through the gate, smiling as she looked over Earth from a huge view viewing window. Here we go. This is... She made a flourishing motion to the doctor. I'll let the doctor describe it. Thank you, he replied, mock bowing to her, and Jesse giggled a little as he put out, put on his smart face. The fourteenth... Mm -hmm, the fourth great and bo bountiful human empire. And there it is, planet Earth at its height. Covered with mega cities, five moons, and population 96, 96 billion. Jesse whistled in astonishment, hearing Adam freeze behind them. The hub of a galactic domain stretching across a million planets, a million species, with, with mankind right in the middle. Jesse snorted when she heard Adam collapse in a faint behind them. The doctor looked over his shoulder, then looked pointly at her. He's your boyfriend. Not in the name of every god and his mother, she retorted, and he chuckled. Come on, Adam, open your mind, the doctor encouraged later as they walked through the hallways. You're going to like this. Fantastic period of history. The human race said it's the most intelligent. Culture, art, politics. This era has gone, got fine, good, has got fine food, good manners. Out of the way, someone shouted. Jessie raised an eyebrow, looking around as people began bustling. She blinked a little more when she heard the food, food being called out. What in the Nimes Realms is a Cronberger? Oh, yes, I'm loving the fine cuisine, she commented sarcastically. My mu my watch must be wrong, the doctor muttered, looking at the said object in confusion. Before he his fr before his brown furrowed in more confusion. No, it's fine. It's weird. That's what you get for showing off, Jesse crowed, punching him in the arm. Your history's not as good as you thought it was. My history's perfect. She made a face. Well, obviously not. They're all human, Adam commented. What about the millions of planets, the millions of species? Where are they? Jesse regarded him impressed. Good question, the doctor told him, obviously thinking the same. Actually, that is a good question. Adam, me old mate, you must be starving. 
No, just a bit time sick. No, you just need a bit of grub. He looked at the nearest vendor and called out to the ch called to the chef. Oi, mate, how much is a Kronk burger? Two credits twenty, sweetheart, he replied. Now join the queue. The doctor turned back, muttering to himself, Money, we need money. Let's use a cash point. Attention all staff, someone announced overhead as the doctor went to one of the cash points. All coverage of the Glasgow water riots being transferred five through nine. There you go, the doctor said brightly, handing a plastic card to Adam. Pocket money. Don't spend it all on sweets. How does it work? Adam asked curiously. Go and find out, the doctor replied, making Jesse smirk. Stop nagging me. The thing is, Adam, time travels like visiting Paris. Jesse began giggling and seem, seeming encouraged. The doctor went on. You can't just read the guidebook. You've got to throw yourself in. Eat the food, use the wrong verbs, get charged double, and end up kissing complete strangers. He looked thoughtful for a second, then asked absently, Or is that just me? Jesse burst out laughing, finally, and Adam looked at her like she was insane, while the doctor smiled, pleased with himself. Stop asking questions. Go and do it. Off you go, then. You're going to get a smack when I get back, Jesse warned, smiling a little when he paled. She plucked the card from Adam's grasp and skipped off. Let's go. The doctor watched them go, then head for the two women who were standing nearby. This is going to sound daft, but can you tell me where I am? One of them, dark skin, turned to him. 4139. Could they write it any bigger? The doctor took little notice of the number number above a door, huge door. Floor 139 of what? The woman looked at him incredibly. Must have been one hell of a party. You're on Satellite, satellite 5, the other woman, light-skinned, replied, supplied the answer. What's Satellite 5? the doctor asked. Come on, the dark-skinned woman protested. How could you get on board without knowing where you are? Look at me. I'm stupid, the doctor said, holding out his arms. Hold on. Wait a minute. The light-skinned woman eyed him oddly. Are you a test, some sort of management test kind of thing? He took the idea. You've got me, he lied. Well done. You're too clever for me. He held up his psychic paper, hoping that it said what they wanted. Apparently did, because the light-skinned woman turned to her friend. We were warned about this in basic training. All workers have to be versed in company pr promotion. Right. Far away. Ask your questions, the dark-skinned woman encouraged, smiling a little flustered. If it gets me to floor 500, I'll do anything. Why? the doctor asked. What happens on floor 500? The walls are made of gold, she replied. And you should know, Mr. Management. So this is what we do. She walks over to a wall monitor, showing off the various new channels. Latest news. Sandstorms of the new Venice Archi Archipelago. 200 dead. Glasgow water riots into their third day. Space Lane 77 closed by sunspot activity. The doctor raised an eyebrow. And over on the Bad Wolf channel, the face of Bo has just announced he's pregnant. One thing surprised the doctor. The fact that the face of Bo was pregnant. But he didn't sit long on that and realize what the woman had said. Bad Wolf. He'd heard the same thing on Platform 1. It had been the mocks of Balloon talking to the face of Bo. I get it, he finally said. He broadcast the news. We are the news, she corrected. We're the journalists. Rewrite it, package it, and sell it. 600 channels, all coming out of Satellite 5, broadcasting everywhere. Nothing happens in the whole human empire without going through us. All staff are reminded that the canteen area now operates a self-cleaning table system. Thank you. Jessie walked back over to Adam, drinking Odin knew what. She plopped down across from him, offering the drink. Try this. It's called Zafik. It's nice. It's like a, er, slush puppy. Adam eyed it. What flavor? She took a drink through the straw. Sort of beef? Adam's eyes widened. Oh my god, I think every it's like everything's gone. Home, family, everything. She sighed, taking out her galaxy. This helps, she told him, sighting it over to him. The doctor gave it a bit of a top up. Who's back home? Your mom and dad? Yeah, he replied. Phone them up, but that's 198,000 years ago. Honestly, try it, she tapped his arm. Go on. Is there a code for planet Earth? She glared at him. Just dial. She watched him do it, and then he began talking. It's sir. Hi, it's me. I've sort of gone traveling. I met these people, and we've gone traveling together. But, er, I'm fine, and I'll call you later. Love you. Bye. She looked at him pointedly as, she, as he hung up, looking at her phone in shock. That is so. An alarm went off, and Jesse stood as everyone began leaving. Oi, Mutt and Jeff! Je Jesse snorted, turning to see the doctor walking over, walking to them. Over here. Jesse held out a hand to Adam. Can I have that back? Adam made a face, but gave her phone back to her. 
Jessie walked over to the doctor, shouting, Who's Mutt and who's Jeff? as she went. Jessie tried to make sense of the room they were in, but just couldn't. She watched seven people, one of them the light-skinned woman the doctor had been talking to, sit at an oct octagon-shaped desk with a chair in the center, while I was coming out of it. Now everybody behave, the other woman ordered, walking up. We have a management inspection. She turned to the doctor. How do you want it, by the books? Right from scratch, he replied, leaning on the railing. Thanks. Okay, she replied, turning around. So, ladies, gentlemen, multisex, undecided, or robot, my name is Cynthia Santini Condal. She threw a look over her shoulder. That's Cynthia with a C, in case you want to write that. In case you want to write to four or five hundred praising me, and please do. Jessie raised an eyebrow as she continued. Now feel, free now feel free to ask any questions. The process of news gathering must be open, honest, and beyond bias. That's complete. That's company policy. Actually, it's the law, the light-skinned woman brought up. Yes, thank you, Suki. Cynthia replied, settling in the chair. Okay, keep it calm. Don't show off for the guests. Here we go, and engage safety. Suki and the other six held their hands over palm prints on the table. Jessie looked around, interested, as light came out of the room. The click of fingers brought her back to Cynthia, and she yelped softly when what appeared to be doors opened up in her forehead. Adam blinked rapidly in confusion. The doctor made no comment as the seven put their hands to the palm prints. And three, two, Cynthia counted down, and spike. A beam of light shot through the door to her head, and the doctor began walking around. Compressed information streaming into her, he began saying, examining everything. Reports from every city, every country, every planet, and they all packaged inside her head. She becomes a part of the software. Her com her brain is the computer. If it all goes through her, through her, she must be a genius, Jessie murmured. Know it all. She blinked, looking around. Smart aleck, bitch. She tuned those voices out, recognizing what they were, focusing again on the doctor. Too much. Her head would blow up. The brain's the processor. As soon as it closes, she forgets. And the people around the cage, she asked, gesturing. They all got tiny little chips in their head, connecting them to her, and they transmit 600 channels. Now that's what I call power. Jesse turned to Adam, seeing how sick he really looked. You all right? I can see her brain, he stated shakily. Do you want to get out? No, he replied hazily. No, this technology, it's amazing. This technology's wrong, the doctor retorted, looking around. Trouble? Jessie guessed, smiling as she felt her adrenaline begin to kick in. He smiled back at her. Oh, yeah. From the side of the chair, Suki pulled her hands away suddenly, and the information beam began to shut down. Cynthia sat up as her portal closed. Come off it, Suki. I wasn't even halfway, she whined. What was that for? Sorry, Suki replied. I must have, it must have been a glitch. Oh. Jessie slowly drew her gun, clicking the safety off. The doctor nodded at her encouragingly as she held it in a ready position. Promotion. She looked up at it as a wall lit up with the word. She raised an eyebrow. Oh? Come on, Cynthia encouraged, almost jumping up and down like a kid. This is it. Come on. Oh, God, make it me. Come on. Say my name. Say my name. Say my name. Promotion for Suki Macri Contro, the boys replied. And Jessie blinked, looking over at Suki. Please proceed to floor 500. I can't believe it, she whispered as she stood. Floor 500. How the hell did you manage that? Cynthia demanded. I'm above you. I don't know, Suki protested. I just applied on the off chance, and they said, they've said yes. Problem? Jessie asked curiously. Cynthia ignored her. That is so not fair, she complained. I have been playing to, four, to floor 500 for three years. Okay, what's floor 500? Jessie asked in exasperation. The doctor shrugged. The walls are made of gold, he offered. Cynthia, I'm going to miss you, Suki told her friend, hugging her. She then turned to the doctor, hugging him as well. Floor 500, thank you. I didn't do anything, he replied. Well, you're my lucky charm. All right, he sighed, hugging her back. I'll hug anyone. He heard Jesse and Adam talking behind him before the pretty boy walked off, and Jesse came back up to him. He's going back to the deck. All staff were reminded that the, six, that's, that the 1640 break session has been shortened by 10 minutes. Thank you. Oh my god, I've got to go, Suki exclaimed. I can't keep them waiting. Say goodbye to Steve for me. She backed up into the lift. Bye. The doctor waved at her as it closed. Good riddance, Cynthia muttered. The doctor stared at her. You're talking like you'll never see her again. She's only going upstairs. We won't. Once you go up to floor 500, you never come back. Have you ever been up there? Jessie asked as they walked back through the news newsroom. I can't, she replied. You need a key for the lift, and you only get a key with promotion. 
No one gets to 500 except for the chosen few. Look, they only give us 20 minutes maintenance. Can't you give it a rest? But you've never been to another floor, the doctor asked, folding his arms as he sat in the broadcast chair. Not even one floor down. 500 floors. You'd think you'd have been on more than one of them, Jesse pointed out. I went to floor 16 when I first arrived. That's medical, Cynthia replied. That's what I got my head done, and then I came straight here. Satellite 5. You work, eat, and sleep on the same floor. That's it. That's all. Like a floating Stark Tower, Jesse mumbled absently, and the doctor started in amusement. Only with 500 floors instead of however many he has. Cynthia narrowed her eyes. You're not management, are you? Can we pass off as, se as security next time? The doctor grinned at Jesse. At last. She's clever. Yeah, well, whatever it is, don't involve me, Cynthia instantly said, backing away. I don't know anything. Don't you even ask? Well, why would I? You're a journalist, the doctor deadpanned, and it was Jesse's turn to snort. Why is all the crew human? What's that got to do anything? There's no alien on aliens on board. Why? I don't know, Cynthia admitted, shrugging. No real reason. They're not banned or anything. Then where are they? Jesse asked. I suppose immigration's tightened up. It, it's had to. What, with all the threats? Threats? Jesse echoed. What threats? The doctor added. Cynthia shrugged. I don't know all of them. Usual stuff. And the price of space warp doubled. So that so that keeps the visitors away. Oh, and the government on Savic 5's collapse, so there's a lot of So that lot stopped coming, you see. Just lots of little reasons, that's all. All adding up to one great big fact, and you didn't even notice, the doctor pointed out. Doctor, I think if there were any kind of conspiracy, Satellite 5 would have seen it. We see everything. I can see better. This society is the wrong shape, even the technology. It's cutting edge. It's backwards, he counted. Countered. There's a great big door in your head. You should have checked that out. this out years ago. So, what do you think's going on, Jesse asked. It's not just this space station, the doctor explained. It's the whole attitude. It's with the way people think. The great and bountiful human empire is stunted. Something's holding it back. And how did you know? Cynthia challenged. Trust me, he replied simply. Humanity has been set back about 90 years. So when did Satellite 5 begin broadcasting? Jesse asked. Cynthia's eyes widened slightly. 91 years ago. Jesse clapped sarcastically. Boom goes the dynamite. We are so going to get in trouble, Cynthia whined as the do doctor began using the sonic screwdriver on a pair of double doors. You're not allowed to touch the mainframe. You're going to get told off. Jesse, tell her to button it, he said. Shut up, Jesse told Cynthia. But you can't just vandalize the place, Cynthia continued, and Jesse groaned in annoyance. Someone's going to notice. The doctor beamed as the doors opened. Yep. He walked inside and began having fun with the wiring. Cynthia shook her head in annoyance and went to leave. This has nothing to do with me. I'm going back to work. The doctor waved absently. Go on then. See you. Cynthia groaned, coming back. I can't just leave you, can I? Tell you what. Jesse turned to her, taking Cynthia. Taking C Cynthia aback. You want to be useful? Get these guys to turn the heating down. It's boiling. What's wrong with the place? Can't they do something about it? I don't know, Cynthia replied. We keep asking. Something to do with a turbine. Something to do with a turbine, the doctor mocked, snorting. Well, I don't know, Cynthia said yet again. Exactly. I give up on you, Cynthia. He pointed her, his sonic at Jesse. No, Jesse. Look at Jesse. Jesse is asking the right kind of question. Well, thank you, she exclaimed in a horrible northern accent. Oi, the doctor frowned at her as she burst out laughing, then continued with his thought process. Why is it so hot? One minute you're rude about the Empire, and the next it's the central heating, Cynthia snorted. Well, never under as Never underestimate plumbing, the doctor advised. Plumbing's very important. After a bit more work, he pulled out a monitor, a schematic on it. Here we go, satellite five, pipes and plumbing. Look at the layout. This is ridiculous, Cynthia declared as she leaned forward to look. You've got access to the computer's core. You can look at the archive, the news, the stock exchange, and you're looking at pipes? But there's something wrong, the doctor pointed out. Why, Jesse asked, looking as well. What is it? The ventilation system, Cynthia replied, pointing. Cooling ducts, ice filters, all working flat out, channeling massive amounts of heat down. All the way from the top, the doctor agreed. From floor 500, Jesse whispered. Something up there is generating tons and tons of heat. Jessie nodded, standing up and clapping her hands. So, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm missing out on a really great party. And it's all upstairs. 
Anyone fancy a trip? You can't, Cynthia protested. You need a key. Keys are just code, the doctor told her, working with the sign again. And I've got the codes right here. Here we go. Override 215.9. Jesse grinned as the code popped up. Cynthia's jaw dropped in amazement. How come it's giving you the code? Someone up there likes me, the doctor replied simply. Jesse turned to Cynthia as the lift opened. Come on, come with us. No way. The doctor just waved as they stepped into the lift. Bye. Well, don't mention my name, Cynthia told him. When you get in trouble, just don't involve me. Jesse snorted as she left. Makes me wonder sometimes if we're just mad. I know I am, the dancer. The doctor answered brightly, grinning at her. So that's her gone. Adam's given up. Looks like it's just you and me. Yeah, Jesse Green. Good. Yep, she said, grinning at him as they intertwined their fingers together, the door closing in on them. Jesse looked around when they made it to floor 500. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think this is the color of gold. The walls are not made of gold, he confirmed, looking at her. You should go back in. Back downstairs. Tough luck, she replied, drawing her gun. The doctor stared at her for a moment, then shrugged, and they both went on. They emerged into what appeared to be a control room, and Jessie's jaw dropped when she saw Sookie among the people working. Sookie! I started without you, someone said, and Jessie turned her gun onto a white-haired pale man. This is fascinating. Satellite 5 contains every bit of information within the four great and bountiful human empire. Birth certificates, shopping ha habits, bank statements, but you two, you don't exist. Not a trace, no birth, no job, not even the slightest kiss. How can you walk through the world and not leave a single footprint? Jessie pushed him out of the way and ran over to Sookie. Can you hear me? She asked desperately, waving her hand in front of Sookie's face. Sookie? She turned to the man angry, raising her gun to his face. What have you done to her? I think she's dead, the doctor told her softly. She's working, Jessie protested. They've all got chips in their head, and the chips keeps going, like puppets, the doctor mused, looking the others over. Oh, you're just full of information, the man told them gleefully. But it's only fair we get some information back, because apparently, you're no one. It's so rare not to know something. Who are you? It doesn't matter, because we're off, the doctor replied, and Jessie straightened. Nice to meet you. Come on. A grip tightened on Jessie's arm, and she screamed in pain. The, mo the doctor moved to get her, but two other zombies grabbed him. Tell me who you are, the man demanded. Since that information's keeping us alive, I'm hardly going to say who I am, the doctor retorted. Well, perhaps my editor-in-chief can convince you otherwise. And who's that? It may interest you to know that this is not the fourth great and bountiful human empire. In fact, it's not actually human at all. The editor, and that's what Jesse decided to call him, went on. It's merely a place where humans happen to live. There is a growl from above, and the editor nodded. Yeah, yeah, sorry. It's a place where humans are allowed to live, by the kind permission of my climate. Jessie's eyes were drawn upward, and she gagged at the sight of a giant lump with nasty teeth. What in the name of Asgard is that? You mean that thing's in charge of Satellite 5? the doctor asked. That thing, as you put it, is in charge of the human race, the editor replied. For almost a hundred years, mankind had been shaped and guided, his knowledge and ambition strictly controlled but by its broadcast news, edited by my superior, your master in humanity's guiding light. The mighty Jagafess of the holy Hadrostic Maxodonville. I call him Max. Good God, was all Jesse had to say to that. She tried to struggle as the zombies placed them in manacles side by side. Great, a climate of create a climate of fear and it's easy to keep the boards, borders closed, the editor continued. It's just a matter of emphasis. The right word and the right broadcast repeated often enough can destabilize an economy, invent an enemy, change a vote. So basically, what you're saying is that everyone on Earth are like slaves, Jesse spat. Bitch, obey. She winced again as the words began thrown, began thrown in her. She winced against the words being thrown in her head as the editor looked at her praisingly. Well, now there's an interesting point. Is a slave a slave if he doesn't know he's enslaved? Yes, the doctor answered. Oh, I was hoping for a, phil a philosophical debate. The editor complained. Is this all I'm going to get? Yes. Yes, the doctor deadpanned. You're no fun. Let me out of these manacles, the doctor suggested angrily. You'll find out how much fun I am. Oh, he's tough, isn't he? The doctor asked. Er, the editor asked. But come on, it isn't a great, isn't it a great system? You've got to admire it, just a little bit. You can't hide something on the scale, Jesse interrupted him. Someone has to have noticed. From time to time, someone, yes, the editor admitted. 
but the computer chip system allowed me to see inside their brains. I can see the smallest doubt and crush it. Then they just carry on, leaving, living the life, strutting about downstairs and all over the surface of the earth like they're so individual. But of course, they're not. They're just cattle. In that respect, the Jagafaris hasn't changed a thing. What about you? You're not a Jagafus. You're human. Yeah, well, simply being human doesn't pay very well. You couldn't have done this all on your own, Jesse pointed out. No, I represent a consortium of banks. Money prefers a long-term investment. Also, the Jagafus needed a little hand to install himself. No wonder, with a creature that size, the doctor commented, what's his life span? Three thousand years, the editor replied casually, as if that was normal to him. That's one hell of a metabolism, generating all that heat. That's why Silent Satellite 5 so hot. You pump it out of the creature and channel it downstairs. Jagafest stays cool. It stays alive. Satellite 5 is one great big life support system. But that's why you're so dangerous, the editor pointed out. Knowledge is power, but you remain unknown. Who are you? The manacles burn with electricity, and Jessie gritted her teeth, absorbing it all. The aether burned through her, protecting her, but it made her weak enough to slump in exhaustion. The doctor noticed through his own shocks and shouted at the editor. Leave her alone. I'm the doctor. She's Jessie Nightshade. We're just wandering. Tell me who you are, the doctor. The editor demanded. I just did. Yes, but who do you work for? Who sent you? Who knows about us? Who exactly? He cut off, a thoughtful expression on his face, leaving Jessie confused. The Jagafest growled and the editor smiled a little. Time, Lord. Jessie's jaw dropped and the doctor looked at just as confused. What? Oh, yes, the editor chuckled. The last of the Time Lords in his traveling machine. Oh, with his little mutant girl from long ago. Mutant. Twisted. Different. Freak. Jessie whimpered, whimpered against the voices in her head. And the doctor glared at the editor. You don't know what you're talking about. Time travel, the editor replied. Someone's been telling you lies. Young Master Adam Mitchell. Jessie lifted her head as an, an image of Adam in the broadcasting chair back in the newsroom popped up. And her jaw dropped. Oh my god, his head. What the hell's he's done? The doctor asked and shocked. What the hell's he gone and done? They're reading his mind. He's telling them everything. And through him, I know everything about you, the editor said smugly. Every piece of information in his head is now mine. And you have infinite knowledge, doctor. The human empire is tiny compared to what you've seen in your T-A-R-D-I-S, TARDIS. Well, you'll never get your hands on it, the doctor spat. I'd die first. Die all you like, the editor replied. Approaching Jessie, I don't need you. He reached up to her neck, and she stiffened as he yanked the chain with her tautest key off of her neck, leaving a burn from where it had come off. I've got the key. Human boys, the doctor snorted. Today we are the headlines, the doctor, the editor declared. We can rewrite history. We could prevent mankind from ever developing. And no one's going to stop you because you've bred a human race that doesn't bother to ask questions, the doctor spat as Jessie rolled her head, trying to stop her neck from hurting. Stupid little slaves, believing every lie. They'll just, they'll just trot right into the slaughterhouse if you're, if they're told it's made of gold. The other, the editor suddenly stiffened. What's happening? Jesse looked up wearily to see him looking over the zombie's shoulders. Someone's dis disengaged the safety. Who's that? Jesse smiled as a familiar person was called up on the screen. It's Cynthia, and she's thinking. The doctor added, grinning. She's using what she knows. Terminator access, the editor ordered. Everything I told her about Silite 5, the pipes, the filters, she's reversing it. Look at that. Jessie watched the icicles begin to melt, and she concentrated. Dark red and black energy appeared around her, spreading out across the room, spreading the heat. Want a hand there, Cynthia? It's getting hot, the doctor cried gleefully. I said terminate her access, the editor shouted, at, shouted to Sookie. Burn out of her mind. The console exploded, and Jessie absorbed the flames with the help of the Aether. She focused her energy on the manacles binding her, and electric shocks and heat burnt, burst, them, burst them apart. She began working on the doctors. She's venting the heat up here. The Jagafest needs to stay cool, and now it's sitting on top of a volcano. Jessie dug through his jacket pocket and pulled out the sonic screwdriver. What do I do with this thing? Flick the switch, he replied, and she did, getting him out of the manacles. Oi, mate, want to bank on an uncertainty? He shouted to the editor. Massive heat and a massive body. Massive bang, he grinned, reaching over and yanking the TARDIS key from the editor's grasp. See you in the headlines. They took off from the room, and Jessie made a run for the lift, raising her hand and blazing fire at icicles that tried to rain down on her. 
A few short moments later, the doctor and Cynthia came running towards her. The moment they were inside the lift, Jessie punched in the code for floor 139. Never again, she sighed, and the doctor chuckled. We're just going to go, the doctor told Cynthia as they approached the bay where the TARDIS was. Too many questions. You'll manage. You'll have to stay and explain it, Cynthia replied. No one's going to believe me. No one believed me when I said I traveled with a mad alien in a blue box. It sounds like he's from the north, Jessie pointed out. They might start believing a lot of things now, the doctor agreed. The human race should accelerate. All back to normal. And what about your friend, Cynthia asked, looking over at Adam, who is against the TARDIS. He's not my friend, the doctor replied darkly, heading over there. Don't kill him, Jessie shouted, and then turned to Cynthia. You saved our lives up there, she told her. Start asking questions, got it? Cynthia smiled and nodded. Got it. Jessie gave her a quick hug, then ran after the doctor as Adam began protesting. I'm all right now, much better, he was saying. Look, it all worked out for the best, didn't it? You know, it's not exactly my fault, because you were in charge. The doctor pushed Adam into the TARDIS, and Jessie ran in after them, closing the door. Keep him, keep him quiet, will you? the doctor asked angrily. Adam opened his mouth to protest, but Jessie wrapped one arm around his neck, her other hand on his mouth. Shut up, she told him. When the TARDIS materialized, the doctor walked over, gently pulled Jessie off of Adam, and then pr proceeded to throw the boy out of the TARDIS. It's my house, uh, my house, Adam breathed. I'm home. Oh my god, I'm home. Blimey. me. I thought you were just going to chuck me out of an airlock. Wish you did, Jessie mur mur muttered. Is there something else you want to tell me? The doctor asked. No, Adam replied, even though he sounded hesitant. What do you mean? The doctor reached into Adam's coat pocket, and Jessie's eyes bugged out. Is that my galaxy? She sputtered. The doctor tossed her what she caught as he went over to the answering machine. The archive of Satellite 5. One second of that message could have changed the world. He aimed the screwdriver at the front, and it exploded promptly. That's it, then, he said, walking back to the TARDIS as Jessie fixed Adam with a death glare. See you. What do you mean, see you? Adam demanded. As in, goodbye, the doctor replied. But what about me? Adam whined. And Jessie rolled her eyes. You can't just go. I've, I've got my head. I've got a chip type, too. He, my head opens. What? The doctor asked. Like this? He clicked his fingers, and the portal opened up. Don't, Adam shouted, clicking his finger as well, closing the portal. Don't do what? The, uh, the doctor asked innocently, opening it again. Stop it, Adam shouted, closing it again. All right now, doctor, that's enough, Jesse finally said. Stop it. Thank you, Adam sighed. She smiled smugly at him before clicking her fingers as well, opening it. Oi! he shouted at her. Sorry, couldn't resist, she said sweetly. Adam growled and snapped his fingers, closing the portal again. You really are a bitch, aren't you? Jessie brought her hand back to slap him, but the doctor caught her wrist tightly. The whole of history could have changed because of you, he told Adam. I just wanted to help. You were helping yourself. And I'm sorry, Adam sputtered, even as Jessie stared at him in shock. I've said I'm sorry, and I am. I really am, but you can't just leave me like this. Leave her. Leave her like the pathetic one she is. Bitch. Worthless. Useless. Yes, I can, the doctor spat. Because if you show that head to anyone, they'll dissect you in seconds. You'll have to live a very quiet life. Keep out of trouble. Be average. Unseen. Good luck. And they turned to go, but Adam shouted at him. But I want to come with you. I only take the best, the doctor retorted. I've got Jessie. What makes her so special, Adam spat. Jessie froze where she stood, staring at him in disbelief. I... Inside, the doctor told her. Go. She backed up inside and waited by the console, taking deep breaths as the voices began their steady chant. Worthless. Dirty. Mutant. Freak different. What makes her special? The doctor asked Adam lowly as he approached, folding his arms. What makes Jessie Nightshade so special? She's a stuck-up estate girl. She grew up different, the doctor smiled, and Adam backed away hurriedly. She may be a mutant, and she may not have had the best life, but she cares about others. She cared enough to protect others from threats. She is one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s best, and unlike someone in the room, she's not selfish. Adam stared at him for a few seconds, and the doctor fixed him with the glare with the glare of the uncalming storm. Who's that? A woman's voice called from outside. It's me, Mum, Adam called back, and the doctor smirked slightly at his panicked tone. Serves him right. Don't come in. Wait there a minute. Oh my lord, you never told me you're coming home, his mother called back. Hold on, I'll just take my coat off. You should have told me you're coming home. I would have gotten got your favorite tea in. Doctor, take me with you, Adam pleaded one last time. He looked over his shoulder. Jesse, please. The doctor looked over his shoulder to see Jesse standing in the doorway of the TARDIS, her face expressionless. He looked back to Adam. I've got the best, he told him simply, and that is not you. 
He guided her back into the TARDIS and set the engines running. The TARDIS materialized and went back into the vortex, and the doctor breathed a sigh of relief as they left the pretty boy in the dust. Chapter 12. The Secret She Keeps Jessie was upset. The doctor knew that. Right after they left at Adam's house, she stormed off. He hadn't tried to stop her, especially when moments later he'd heard the sound of gunshots. Gunshots from the shooting range the TARDIS had apparently made for her. He read it... He headed right for the kitchen instead, making smirking a little when he saw that she'd taken two bottles of water with her. You clever girl, he chuckled, setting the tea on the the tea kettle on the burner. As he watched it go, he couldn't stop the growl escaping when his thoughts about how Adam had thrown those insults right in her face, and her expression afterwards. It's like she wasn't even there. She was sexually abused two years of her life. That was what Celine had said, seven years ago. Jessie was 20 now. It had all started when she was 13. No wonder why she, no wonder why she was still haunted by those memories. And he knew there is, there were other secrets she kept. Bang, bang, bang. Jessie unleashed round after round, letting thoughts out with each thought. Worthless, dirty, bitch. She stopped for a moment, thinking, "Don't let anyone tell you you're not in person, not important." Coulson had told her, "Someone's going to be there to help you through." Jessie Grant had also told her. As long as I live, I'll promise to be that person. And now, Grant was gone. Because you weren't there on the mission, the little voice inside her head taunted. The one mission you didn't take, and now he's dead. Shut up, she barked at the voice. You weren't there for either of them. Coulson had no reassurance the first time he died. And Grant had no one. Useless, abandoned, selfish. Jessie squeezed her eyes shut, walking over to the table to get one of the bottles of water. This couldn't go on. She didn't know how many more voices she could take, and then she had it. Taking a deep breath, she headed for the showers. The doctor reclined in the captain's chair, still drinking his tea. There was definitely something Jessie still wasn't saying. The question was what? The face of Bo had said she would break at some point. The doctor looked into his cup, frowning. How can I ten tell when she'll break when she's not telling me everything? He was so wrapped up in his thoughts, he didn't hear her come in. Not until she said his name. Doctor? Okay, so that was chapter 11 and 12 of the first book in the Bad Wolf Chronicles. Alrighty, peace out, knights.